I wanted to say a few words of introduction for Dr. Peter Redpath. Peter Redpath is a fellow who um, took some of those street smarts, uh, developed while he was being brought up in Brooklyn, New York, and he's taken those and employed them in the cultivation of a philosophical vocation. I mean, who would do this? But Peter Redpath is full of surprises. One surprise was his energy and enthusiasm to put together this conference that we're going to enjoy this week. Um, one of the reasons we have this conference is because of the sponsorship of the Adler Aquinas Institute, which Dr. Redpath is rector of. I should also mention that the chancellor of the Adler Aquinas Institute is Joseph Fescio, SJ, who is a founder of Ignatius Press. So with um, Father Fescio and Dr. Redpath, we have excellent leadership at the Adler Aquinas Institute. Uh, Dr. Redpath is uh, one of the motives also for this conference is uh, <clears throat> to announce the formation of an Aquinas School of Leadership, uh, Management, and Organizational Development, which you'll have more to tell about. Uh, he has an association, as many of you know, with Holy Apostles College and Seminary um, <clears throat> with regard to their Thomistic Studies program. Speaking of Thomistic Studies, he also has an association with the Thomistic Studies program at Abba Oliva in Barcelona, Spain. So Dr. Redpath is always busy. Take this into account, plus the fact that he had taught for 40 years at St. John's University, retiring in 2010. Dr. Redpath has published 12 books. He's uh, published dozens of articles and reviews. Um, among his many books, I like his titles because, you know, they say you can't judge a book by its cover. I never believe that, especially if the book is adorned with a nice title cover with a good title. And Dr. Redpath always has good oracular titles, like Cartesian Nightmare, The Masquerade of the Dreamwalkers, uh, Not So Elementary Christian Metaphysics, which by the way is not very elementary. I've read that, and it uh, can be tough going at times. <clears throat> but uh, not only are his the, the covers of his books titled well, sometimes the chapters inside the book, inside the books have them, interesting titles as well. Um, for example, Dirty Dancing, that's a chapter on American education. The Urge to Emerge, that's a chapter on Rousseau. I Am Music, they have Hegel, yeah. Wake Up, Wake Up, You Sleepy Head, is that Trump? That's Trump. And my personal favorite, How Not to Become a Philosophical Fashion. Now, Dr. Redpath has given over 200 invited guest lectures nationally and internationally at places that have included the Vatican, the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Military Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Cini Foundation in Venice, St. Andrews University, Scotland, the University of Chicago, <coughs> Princeton University, the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin, and the Nicholas Copernicus University in Torin, Poland. He also taught convicts at Rikers Island that they still talk about getting an exercise there. <laughs> Peter is co-founder of the Gilson Society in America and the International Etienne Gilson Society. He's former vice president of the American American Association. <clears throat> He's founding chairman of the Board of the Angelican Academy Homeschool Program since 2000. He's a member of the Board of Directors of the Great Books Academy Homeschool Program, member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Advanced Philosophic Research, a member of the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of the Catholic Education Foundation, former member of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, academician of the Catholic Academy of Sciences in the United States of America, former executive editor of Value Inquiry Book Series, that's uh, abbreviated VIBS, <coughs> that's in, um, that's in Dobie Press, and he was the editor of the studies in the history of Western Philosophy and the Jill Studies, also for editions were going to be. 
He is a former associate editor and current advisor of the Journal of Contemporary Philosophy. He's a recipient of St. John University's St. John's University's Outstanding Achievement Award, the Reality Award for Service, the Socratic Fellowship Award, and the Great Books Academy. Inaugural inductee as distinguished alumnus of Zavarian High School in Brooklyn, New York, and former graduate fellow of SUNY at Buffalo. Peter is also a former member of the New York Press Club, former managing editor of the Staten Island based monthly newspaper, the Staten Island Eagle, and a right to life candidate for comptroller of the city of New York in 1989. <clears throat> Throughout his career, he has appeared on panels with, among others, Daniel Bell, Cicela Bach, Robert Bork, John Dealey, Jude P. Doherty, Gene Elstein, Amitai Etzioni, Thomas Frank, John Lewis Gaddis, William Galston, Robert George, Marianne Glendon, John and Russell Hittinger, Paul Oscar Christella, Anthony Lewis, Herb London, David Little, John Lukash, uh, Alistair McIntyre, Ralph McInerney, Eric McLuhan, Richard Newhouse, Michael Novak, John O'Sullivan, Paul Ricoeur, Joe Rosenthal, Rosenthal, Robert Royal, Oscar Schachter, <coughs> James Shaw, Richard Schick, Donald Schreiber, Paul Sigmund, James Weisseifel, Ken Woodward, and Daniel Mikelovich. <coughs> Over the years, his scholarly research has been praised by thinkers such as Frederick Cobbleson, Michael Novak, Henry Beach, Ralph McInerney, and Jude Doherty. Regarding one of Peter's works, Dean Emeritus of the Catholic University of America School of Philosophy, Jude Doherty, has said, in quoting Jude here, given the breadth of his historical survey and his analytic power, he is reminiscent of Hegel at his most sweeping. This is obviously the work of a mature scholar, the reflections of a learned and serious philosopher who shows clearly that ideas have consequences, even when they are of the most removed and metaphysically abstract. To open this book is to be captivated by Redpath's unconventional view of modernity. One puts it down with the conviction that one has encountered a profound thinker at work. And if you know Jude Doherty, he gives praise very sparingly. So that's something to hang your head on, I think. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Redpath's colleague, John Neely, about whom Etienne Gilson once quipped that he was an intelligent Thomas, we're still puzzling over the way he say something. <clears throat> As on more than one occasion, told Dr. Redpath that he finds Peter's work to be more original than that of Mary Tan and Gilson. So in that spirit, I give you another intelligent talk. <laughs> Before I, I start my presentation this evening, I want to thank all of the participants and co-sponsors who helped organize this historic event. And I know that many of you have traveled far distances to get here. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, your having done that, especially uh, in such short notice for organizing the, uh, this conference. If this conference is going to be a smashing success, which I think it is, uh, this is largely going to be due to the fact that, that uh, we have a terrific mix of extremely intelligent people who are going to be discussing the really important issues. So I really appreciate you all coming to this. Uh, and. Uh, in saying it's an historic event, I, I employed a phrase I've used several times related to conferences in which the Gilson Society in the United States and its offspring, the international. <coughs> Can't hear? No? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I employ a phrase I've used several times uh, related to conferences in which the Gilson Society in the United States and its offspring, the International ATN Gilson Society, have been involved for several decades. Bear with me as I explain to you why this is so, for it is directly related to why I have encouraged all of you to participate in this International Congress. Catholics and Christians, as well as most people who claim to know about philosophy and its history, know how historically philosophers, and especially Catholics and other Christians, have depended upon the power of signs to confirm the providential nature of their work and its nature as philosophical. Consider, for example, the Herculean labor upon which the oracle at Delphi had sent Socrates millennia ago. 
Think about Lady Philosophy's coming to Boethius to console him as he sought to assuage his grief by ruining his soul through reading poetry. Consider the father of modern philosophy, Rene Descartes' three famous dreams, coming in part from the spirit of truth, in which, among other things, Descartes found himself struggling violently against a whirlwind as he was trying to reach a church at his Jesuit college in the flesh. Turning to show a courtesy to a man he had neglected to greet, hearing a report in the courtyard, in the courtyard that someone had a melon to give him, hearing a crack of lightning that terrified him, as he saw thousands of sparks in his room, noticing a dictionary and book of poetry, opening a passage that read, What path shall I follow in life? by an unknown man giving him a bit of verse with the Latin words est et non included in it. Who can forget the famous inspiration that came to Jean-Jacques Rousseau on a hot summer day in 1749 when, as he walked along the long, hot, dusty road, he read about a philosophical essay contest sponsored by the Academy of Dijon and said he suddenly saw another world and became a new man. So overcome was he by this clearly inspirational event that he felt his spirit dazzled by a thousand lights. He reports that crowds of vivid ideas so overwhelmed and confused him with an irrepressible tumult that his brain started to turn as if in a state of drunkenness. His heart started violently to palpitate, causing his chest to heave. Not being able to breathe, to regain composure, he threw himself under a tree where he remained in a state of agitation for a half hour. Upon rising, even though he had been totally unaware he had been weeping, he found his waistcoat wet with tears. Well, think about the spiritual significance that Sir Isaac Newton had given to the fact that he had been born on Christmas Day, confirming for him that he was a prophet and a star of the descent of the ancient Magi. I'm no different than any of these other men whose life's quest has been repeatedly confirmed by signs and oracles of different sorts. Like Milton considered the date of my birth, 16 August 1945, under the zodiac sign of Leo, <laughs> clearly included, indicating a life of leadership. The day after the Feast of the Assumption, on which I was expected to be born, on the very day that people in the United States had received reports of the surrender of Japan to the United States ended World War II, and the day on which, decades later, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, would die. <laughs> Consider how, like Socrates, I have virtually nothing I can claim to know, unaided by inspiration, as Richard and Gardner will attest to in my mate at St. John's for so many years. Ask anyone who has known me for any extent of time, or any student that I've ever had in class, who she will verify it. Also consider how, like Socrates, Descartes, and Rousseau, the start of my philosophical quest was heralded by several miraculous signs. On the Feast of All Souls, on the 2nd of November 1996, approximately 10 years after having myself asked myself what course I should steer for the rest of my academic life, through what appeared to be a chance event, I arbitrarily opened a page in a work written by Father Armand de Mauer to recall the astounding to, to recall the astounding claim that according to St. Thomas Aquinas, philosophy is chiefly a habit of mind not a body of knowledge, which had caused me to remember a puzzling claim I had come across in an annotated footnote in another work by Mao, or the Mao, that the genus that is the subject of philosopher studies is not the genus the subject of logician studies. Illuminating on these events for about a decade, on that holy feast day, I delivered a paper entitled Why Descartes is Not a Philosopher at an international congress of the American Maritime Association held at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. My faithful sidekick in this decade-long quest, Curtis Hancock, was there on that historic day and witnessed three miraculous events <laughs> that happened to me. A number that many of you will recognize for its special spiritual significance for Christians in general, Georg Hegel, uh, and me. Curtis is here now and can verify for you, for you the report of what happened to me actually did happen. On that day, after hearing my argument, John Canassus, from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, was so moved by an evidently malicious spirit that against every natural inclination of his being, he told the audience he felt compelled to take sides against my claim that, strictly speaking, Descartes was no philosopher, and that, strictly speaking, he was a sophist, or as I called him that day, a transcendental sophist. Anyone who knows John Canassus can attest that nothing short of some sort of 
evil genie could have caused him to turn from his own natural inclination to dislike everything Cartesian and come to a defense of Descartes against the fellow student of St. Thomas. What happened next, however, was so miraculous that we're not Curtis Hancock here to verify events. I would not have the courage to report them, lest you might think me a bit mentally unstable. No sooner had my session ended at that conference than that a short rain immediately occurred, followed by the most glorious raindrop I'd ever seen. Following the rainbow, Curtis and I, Curtis is from Kansas, uh, took refuge from under a tree when suddenly a crack like a burst of lightning broke a limb of the tree under which I was standing when coming out from out of nowhere, one of our colleagues pushed me out of the way, saving me from death or serious injury. Recognizing the significance of the event, as Curtis can test, I immediately collected parts of that sacred vow and have kept them to this day above a William Shekel portrait where Jacques Maritain with flames radiating from his head that hangs in my office at my home in Cave Creek, Arizona, located in North Phoenix. Again, note how the reference to a cave, a phoenix, and the last three years of my life being spent like St. Anthony in the desert, <laughs> preparing for this <laughs> are all signs of this conference's <laughs> inspirational philosophical <laughs> significance. So too is, is the event that happened on the evening of November the 2nd, 1996. But what is occurring today is the historical descendant with modification of a series of developments essentially connected to what happened that evening. In a sense, all of us here, here today, because of what happened that night in a hot tub in Tempe, Arizona, <laughs> when reflecting on the series of miraculous events that had transpired that day, a longtime friend of Curtis and me, Tom Michaud, asked me what was my long-term goal related to the research I'd been doing. In the same matter of fact, the typically humble manner that had come to be my trademark, I answer that my chief goal was to change the popular understanding of philosophy and higher education globally. <laughs> to my surprise, Tom Michaud could not help rig out and howl at the fog, after which he decided to join Curtis and be to start a renaissance in learning that would eventually reunite philosophy and science and science and wisdom. Along the way, about ten years later, through providential intervention, we were joined in this quest by our colleagues Pat Carmack and Steve Bertucci, who, with the help of Mortimer J. Adler and his partner in crime at the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas, Max Wiseman, helped us build an international Great Books homeschool program called the Great Books Academy and the Angelicum Academy. With the help of Father Joseph Bessio, publisher of the Ignatius Press, we recently formally what we have conceived to be a kind of combination of an online monastery and Renaissance Academy to preserve the best of works of classical Western cultural heritage for future generations, the Adler Aquinas Institute. So then, now you know why you are here. Today is the day that, with the help of our co-sponsors, especially Holy Apostles College and Seminary, we begin in earnest to take this decades-long counter-revolution to reunite, reunite philosophy and science, and science and wisdom to the next level, by turning our attention to a cultural crisis of monumental proportions that only a reunification of philosophy and science and science and wisdom can remedy. That the world suffers from a leadership deficit today is evident to any psychologically healthy human adult, aware of contemporary cultural events locally, nationally, or internationally. In all human industries and organizations, increasingly on a global scale, people called leaders appear no longer to understand how to lead, and inmates appear to be running the cultural asylums. Just as several decades ago, the French existentialist thinker Gabriel Marcel described his contemporary world on all cultural levels, the current world appears to be broken, like a watch that no longer works. While throughout human history, human cultures have always been somewhat pathological, today the pathology has grown to epic proportions that threaten the future of global, including Western civilization. A proper and swift Diagnosis of the chief causes of this civilization disorder is crucial so that proper remedies can be administered as swiftly as possible to help restore the world to global cultural health. As Mortimer J. Adler observed in his 1940 article presented in New York City at a conference on science, philosophy, and religion entitled God and the Professors, like the health and disease of the body, cultural health consists in organizational health. 
the harmonious functioning of its parts and cultures, uh, and cultures die from lack of harmonious functioning of these parts. He added that science, philosophy, and religion are certainly major parts of European culture. Their distinction from one another is quite separate parts is certainly the most characteristic cultural achievement of modern times. But if they have not been properly distinguished, they cannot be properly related. And unless they are properly related, properly ordered to one another, cultural disorders such as that of modern times inevitably results. In short, Adler was maintained that if we do not properly understand the natures of things, especially of culturally, re culturally related organizations, like religion, science, philosophy, we cannot properly relate and unite them as complementary parts of a co coherent cultural whole or healthy cultural organization. This, however, is precisely the problem we have with solving the decline of Western culture and global civilization in our time. We do not properly understand the natures of things, and especially of the natures of philosophy, science, and religion. Or the way common sense essentially relates to all these, and how, through this relation, the natural human desire to have common sense regulate all aspects of human life uses the natures of things, arts, philosophy, science, and religion to generate cultures and civilizations as parts of organizational wholes. During the early part of the 20th century, this lack of common sense was so bad that it prompted Abbott to write his scathing 1940s Harper's Magazine article, This Pre-War Generation, in which, among other things, he accused post-World War I American young people of having a mindset largely similar to that of Hitler's youth. Our college students today, like Thrasymachus of old, Adler said, regard justice as the will of the stronger, but, make, but unlike the ancient sophists, they cannot make the point as clearly, uh, as clearly or defend it as well. Immediately, Adler went on to add that while American students might not have read Mein Kampf and might not have been inoculated with nihilism's revolutionary spirit, they have become the same sort of realists, believing only in the same sort of success, money, fame, and power. While their understanding of success was not identical with that of the Hitler youth, while by success they understood personal achievement, individual power, money, fame, not mystical identification of the individual with success in Germany working for the fatherland, post-World War I and pre-World War II American youth did not think that democracy was intrinsically superior to fascism. Hence, add the claim that American youth would continue to work for democracy only so long as democracy continued to work for them, only so long as it continued to serve their sense of pragmatic liberalism. Adler did not think that post-World War I American culture alone had generated this post-World War I mindset. He maintained that centuries of Western cultural change had prepared the minds of American youth to become sophists. He argued that this situation was the last fruition of modern man's exclusive trust in science and his gradual disavowal of whatever lies behind the field of science as irrational prejudice, an opinion emotionally held. While Adler considered the doctrine of scientism to be the dominant dogma of American philosophy, during the early part of the 20th century he maintained that this last fruition of modern thought had received its finishing touches in university philosophy courses, reaching its culmination in American pragmatism and all its sequela, the numerous varieties of positivism. Now they added that all these varieties read about one and the same reductionistic point. Only science gives us valid knowledge of reality. So that being the case, Adler maintained that at best, philosophy can be nothing more than a kind of commentary on the findings of science. And at its worst, when it refuses to acknowledge the exclusive right of scientific method to marshal evidence and draw conclusions therefrom, philosophy is either mere opinion or nonsensical verbiage. In the above claim, Adler does not explicitly state another more important role that at least, at best, philosophy could become in the modern world. The sophistic source of metaphysical fables about the origin of human consciousness to justify the claim that the whole of truth is to be found in modern physical science. Nonetheless, Adler implicitly well understood this other role. Hence, in philosophy courses, Adler continued, the student really learns how to argue like a sophist against all values as subjective and relative. Instead of being the last bulwark against the scientist and that every other part of the curriculum, especially social science, professes or insinuates, he said philosophy forces reinforce the negativism of this doctrine by inspiring disrespect for any philosophy which claims to be independent knowledge. To finish their job, Adler asserted that philosophy departments use semanticism, 
to implement the ancient sophistries they had revived. The student likes to suspect all words, especially abstract words, statements which cannot be scientifically verified are meaningless. The abstract words which enter into moral judgments, such words as justice and right and even liberty and happiness, have only rhetorical meaning. Denuded of all deceptive verbiage, such judgments can be reduced to statements of what I like or what displeases me. There is no should or ought. While I have rightly understood the sophistic nature of most 20th century American philosophy departments, I'm puzzled he would use, he would call such departments philosophical. Most 20th century U.S. college and university departments were not examples of the degenerative tendency of modern philosophy. They were and still are prime examples of the modern lack of philosophy, of the degenerative cultural effects of neo-sophistry, fulfilling its nature in modern times under the rubric of philosophy. As that great master of common sense, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, once observed, since the modern world began in the 16th century, nobody's system of philosophy has really corresponded to everybody's sense of reality, to what, if left to themselves, common men would call common sense. Each started with a paradox, a peculiar point of view, demanding the sacrifice of what they would call a sane point of view. That is one thing common to Hobbes and Hegel, to Kant and Bergson, to Barclay and William James. A man had to believe something that no normal man would believe if it were suddenly propounded to his simplicity. As that law is above right, or right is outside reason, or things are only as we think them, or everything is relative to a reality that is not there. The modern philosopher claims like a sort of confidence man that if once we were granting this, the rest will be easy. He will straighten out the world that once he was allowed to give this one twist to the mind. One of the many twists in which modern scientists and philosophers falsely so called tend to glory is that things have no natures. Or if they do, that only physical sciences can know what these are and tell us about the way they relate and act. Indeed, according to many of these thinkers, those of us that maintain otherwise must be intellectually backward, intolerant, bigoted, worse, medieval, and must be forced to become scientifically enlightened and made scientifically free through educational and political re-education programs and a series of social experiments and acts of intimidation to recognize our intellectual and cultural backwardness so as to embrace true scientific freedom, which only thinking in such a modern way can bring us. So an ancient Greek philosopher like Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, such claims defy common sense. These men to be considered the universe to be one large everlasting nature or operational organization a giant composite whole in which smaller natures or operational organizations exist. As another master of common sense, our friend Father James B. Shaw has observed, there are things and we can know them. Is how the French philosopher A.T. Angel someone put, once put the first intellectual affirmation that we must implicitly make before we can state anything else. If we doubt either of these, either that there are things or that we can know them, we cannot get out of ourselves. Nothing is clearer than these two statements and what they stand for. They're, they are first principles, evident. Nothing can be and not be at the same time. A thing cannot be true and false at the same time and in the same manner. We must distinguish. This distinguishing is why we have minds. Nothing improves such immediate principles because nothing is clearer. To deny them is to affirm them. Their denial at one point or another leads to the construction of alternate worlds from the one that is, whatever first principles we select, we seek to explain everything else in their light. What Shaw makes evident to us, and what he says, is that explicit awareness of the common sense principle of non-contradiction is not the first of first principles of common sense. As Shaw knows, even implicit awareness of this first principle of knowing, an intelligible and, in, and meaningful speech occurs vaguely, implicitly, and simultaneously with and naturally depends upon a more explicit, natural conviction that a human being possesses a human soul with reliable known faculties. For this reason, among others, explicit conviction about the reliability of the senses and the sense-knowing powers preceded among ancient philosophers like Thales and the early physicists the explicit discovery of the metaphysical and logical principle of non-contradiction through the paradoxes first raised by Parmenides' student Zero of Elia and the early ancient Greek acceptance of the reality of the human soul. As any educated adult should know from human experience, 
precisely to acquire any art or science, a person must first be able to establish an intellectual relationship with an imperfectly developed whole, like an incompletely healthy body, an incompletely perfected business, a somewhat impoverished person, dangers and voyages that only the skill of a pilot can remedy, or a block of marble, marble that can become the Pietà or David, at the hands of a master like Michelangelo Monterotti. An art or science grows out of a human habit to which a subject known relates, that the subject known helps generate and activate within a natural human knowing faculty. For example, even before it is finished, a finished whole, the genius of a Michelangelo can imagine the way the parts of the statue exist within a suitable piece of marble, just as a good medical doctor can imagine the way the parts of the diseased organ are unharmoniously related so as to generate the illness whose symptoms the physician has observed and seeks to correct. Every art, science, or philosophical activity grows out of the experiential relationship between the specific habit of an artist or philosopher and a known material or subject that activates the habit. Eliminate one of the essential parts of the relationship and the activity can no longer exist. No such subject, such as somewhat sickly bodies, known or no habit of medicine in a physician, no art of medicine. The relation between the artist or scientist and the artistic or scientific subject known <coughs> generates the habit, an act of art and science. The two are essentially connected. Eliminate one or the other extreme of the relationship and the artistic, scientific, or philosophical activity becomes destroyed. The above claim is universally true everywhere, for all time, for everyone. On an implicit level, most human beings know this, wishing or hoping that it will not be true, will not make it not true. No real enemies known to exist, and no real military habits, and no military science can exist for anyone. Many self-professed modern philosophers, scientists, generally deny the existence of human habits existing in a human subject. They also generally deny the existence of real natures, composite wholes, and real aims in things, which human subjects cannot. Many, even contemporary physicists, deny the reality of principles like potency and privation, upon which the qualities of resistance and receptivity in matter, upon which Galileo Galilei's new theory of motion, and Albert Einstein's teaching about general and special relativity essentially depend, in addition to the existence of real qualities, contraries, relations, and organization. Even professed students of St. Thomas and other self-proclaimed sense realists who admit the existence of human habits and real natures existing within facultatively independent beings tend to have no awareness of the essential connection that St. Thomas, Aristotle, and even Plato made between human habits and the subject known as constituting the essence of philosophy or science rightly understood. Instead, they tend to think of St. Thomas's teaching in classical sense realism in general as a logical system or of philosophical principles chiefly as logical premises. As a result, pretty much no contemporary intellectual is able rationally to explain the nature of philosophy, art, or science as a humanly produced act. Nonetheless, when we praise someone for being scientific or artistic, we are not chiefly praising the fact that a person has scientific or artistic knowledge. We are chiefly praising the fact that this person has a personal quality capable of producing such exceptional knowledge. Not the fact that the person in some way possesses it, but the knowledge is simply something someone has copied or stolen from someone else, or a bunch of purported facts that a person has memorized. That knowledge is not produced, not the product of art or science, but chiefly worthy of praise. <clears throat> What makes it a product of all the sciences and chiefly worthy of praise is that an exceptional quality of soul has produced it. Many years ago, the satirist Ambrose Pierce, with some truth, said that a philosopher is someone who tells a person what he or she already knows in a language that person does not understand. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the truth contained in Pierce's statement resides and something that people who want to think philosophically or scientifically often fail to realize, but which was evident to ancient Greek philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That philosophy is chiefly 
and directly an intellectual awareness generated by a prior knowledge a person has had of things. Not a direct knowledge of things considered simply in themselves. Decades ago, such a realization struck me when I came to recognize that none of my colleagues in any of the university disciplines where I had ever worked or studied, nor I, could make intelligible to me precisely what was the nature of our profession, where we got our principles, how we got these principles, or why they worked. Decades before me, Warner Miranda had a similar but more narrow experience giving up the practice of psychology after having received a PhD in it because he had become aware of his inability to explain to himself and anyone else what was his subject or its principles. Sometime thereafter, before I had delivered my November the 2nd, 1996 talk in Tempe, I came across a statement by one of the leading Catholic intellectuals of the 20th century, Jacques Maritain, claiming that modern philosophy was not philosophy. As a result, chiefly of those two events, plus the events of November the 2nd, 1996, and the claim Father Maurer had made about St. Thomas maintaining that philosophy was chiefly out of the mind and out of body of knowledge, and that the, subject, that the philosopher's studies is not the subject of logician study. I started an intense examination of Western intellectual history to determine whether Maritain was right and to discover what the subject of philosophy might be. Somewhat like Odysseus returning to Troy, I spent 10 years doing this. At the end, I decided Maritain was right. Most contemporary philosophers are not philosophers. <coughs> I even went beyond Maritain, concluding, strictly speaking, most people in the so-called history of philosophy were not philosophers, that philosophy more or less ended with the ancient Greeks, and that, strictly speaking, even what we call science today cannot be science. Today, as far as I can tell, most professional pr practitioners of what people call philosophy, including most students of St. Thomas, tend to think that philosophy is a body of knowledge or a logical system of ideas, and science is a body of empirically demonstrable facts. Often many people who claim to be philosophers today will maintain that philosophy differs from other subjects because philosophers ask the question why, not the question how, or they will make some other weak generalization such as that philosophers ask meaningful questions. Through this research I came to realize that ancient, the ancient Greeks chiefly studied their knowledge of things, not ideas. More precisely they studied their knowledge of the actions of things inasmuch as they found this knowledge to be presenting them with paradoxes in what in Book 7 of his famous Republic Plato calls provocative thought, or apparent contradictions about which they decided to wonder. Their chief concern was to understand what precisely existed within some multitude of things and human not knowing faculties that enabled that multitude to act the way it did and present the human senses and intellect with apparently contradictory communications or reports. Their chief interest was to understand causes of organizational unity. In action and apparent contradictions, these actions present the human knowledge, not abstract numerical relations. They recognize that organizational unity accounts for organizational action. And in a way, organizational action results from harmonizing opposition between and among organizational parts, much like an orchestra leader does. They, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle especially, generally agree that partial, not total, organizational opposition causes action. And apparent contradictions because total opposition within a multitude causes total chaos, anarchy, and immobility. While partial, not total, opposition allows one principle of organization to dominate the others. Rule in the multitude as a common source of unity, leadership, and cause of order, and uniform direction within it. They generally agree that opposition between two things within an organizational whole could not be so great that the existence of one part of an organization would totally annihilate the existence of the other. The parts of organizations must include opposites, but these opposites must not be so greatly opposed that they cannot simultaneously coexist and complement one another. Hence they concluded that the existence of action generated by organizational wholes or nature could not be generated by contradictory opposition, because the existence of, of, of one contradictory opposite precludes the existence of any other opposite. Total opposites in a contradictory sense can never be united, in short, because in the case of total opposites, only one of them can exist at any one moment. 
If the only sort of opposition that existed in the universe were contradictory opposition, as Aristotle more than anyone else among the ancient Greeks finally came to realize, no organizational unity could exist, and no organizational, organizational action could be. But organizational action does exist. So wherever action exists in the physical universe, Aristotle recognized that human beings could discover parts existing within an organization or substance, harmonizing opposing actions, like giving and taking, delivering and receiving, commanding and being commanded, through the influence of a leading part, communicating a general rule of action to other parts of the organization. Hence, Aristotle concluded another kind of opposition must exist that enables multitudes to be partially united through relationships of sameness, equality, and similarity, which can generate principles of sense wonder in philosophy or science and can lead to theoretical, scientific divisions like metaphysics based upon substantial sameness, mathematics based upon quantitative equality, and physics based upon qualitative similarity, all of which in a way express a qualitative unity among beings that are not totally one. Aristotle called this kind of opposition contrariety. He considered it to be a foundation of all reality-based paradoxes, including that of sense wonder, which for all ancient Greeks had been a first principle of philosophy, and as Gilson recognized centuries later, for every human being for all time. Aristotle also realized that realized ancient Greeks had recognized that organizational unity was more or less strong depending upon the parts being united and the way they are united. He came to understand that thinkers who had preceded him had conceived of unity chiefly as a qualitative cause a principle of indivision, indivisibility, and indestructibility, not as a principle of number. For this reason, Aristotle said that the unity, which is the principle of being, that is the principle of an organizational whole, is not identical with the unity that is the principle of number, that is the principle of quantity, which is the subject of the study of mathematics. As Aristotle realized, a unit, the unity of a nation, a military unit, or a healthy person is not the same as the unity of a numerical multitude or magnitude. Different multitudes have different intrinsic principles of unity. That's what puts them into a genus. Know what they are, and you know how to build and destroy organizations, perfect or debilitate their actions. This is chiefly what the genius of the ancient Greeks recognized that philosophical study, scientific study, could identify. Hence, their chief interest in and their development of this subject. Little wonder then, should have guessed, that the greatest of the ancient Greek philosophers would have been the tutor of the military genius Alexander the Great. This philosophical understanding of the ancient Greeks is something that, at least implicitly, Etienne Gilson realized when he wrote his classic historical philosophical thriller, The Unity of Philosophical Experience, about what happens to purportedly, to purportedly philosophical teachings once they leave the abstract thought of so-called philosophers, and these thinkers and their students or dis disciples try to put them into practical use in the real world, Gilson tells this tale by chiefly weaving together two principles that he takes from history and philosophy, especially from ancient Greek common sense. While Gilson does not say so explicitly, from ancient Greek common sense, he takes the classical philosophical principle Expressed later on in medieval Latin, in the medieval Latin maxim, Agere Sacri Teresa, that things tend to act according to the nature, so according to this, the organizational unity they have. Before anything can act in this world of ours, there must be a unity, a composite, an organizational whole. Hence, when an organizational whole that is a dog or a cat acts, a dog will act, tend to act like a dog, a cat will tend to act like a cat, and so on. Just an extent and transposes this principle to human behavior and comes up with a more specific common sense principle regarding human psychology. We human beings think and act the way we can, according to our natural and acquired facultative abilities, not the way we wish. The way we act tends to reflect our natural and acquired organizational abilities, the principles we apply, not our wishes. From this extension and transposition, Wilson makes a further extension and transposition to history and derives the historical principle that once we accept a specific teaching as a chief principle to guide our action, 
and then attempt to apply it to reality, that teaching takes on a life of its own, leading, leading perhaps to consequences that its author never envisioned and with it, which its author might vehemently disagree. From history alone, Gilson makes the observation that often people call philosophers tend not to learn from philosophical experience. Once we find that our principles do not work when we try to apply them with logical consistency to the real world, instead of rejecting our principles as real philosophers and people of common sense would do, we often try to dodge the consequences of our foolishness by rejecting the ways of the world, not the ways of our false principles. In short, Gilson recognized that we choose philosophical scientific principles the way we can, not the way we wish. Hence, even if the wishing is done by sincere, enlightened intellectuals, wishing them to be so will never make them so. Will never make non-philosophical, non-scientific principles philosophical or scientific. Nonetheless, on such an occasion, uh, the philosopher falsely so-called tends to evince a kind of behavior the opposite of St. Augustine's faith-seeking understanding. What I call a refusal to understand in order to be able to continue to believe. As Chesterton observes, such behavior often exhibits the quality of a confidence man, coming to realize his confidence is without foundation, or of being what Plato calls a philosophical bastard, not a true philosopher. Failing to understand the natures of things, we cannot properly understand the nature of religion, and we like, we relate unite philosophy and science to religion to produce a healthy culture and civilization. Worse, our actions will be totally incapable of reflect, reflecting prudential judgment. For this reason, in his politics, Aristotle chiefly defined the barbarian as someone who cannot think prudently because he denies the existence of natures and things, because such a person has an essentially anarchic mind. The reason for this is that by being incapable of recognizing principles, archive, in things, the person can never understand their natures, the organizational unity of their parts, their essential internal relationships, and can never anticipate beforehand how they will act in the future. Following the lead of the ancient Greeks and St. Thomas, Gilson and Father Shaw, by common sense, I mean chiefly principles rooted in sensation. They make all human experience, sense, wonder, and philosophy, science possible. Reflecting upon the common sense realism of the ancient Greeks and St. Thomas, unlike some of our contemporaries who would diagnose the chief cause of our contemporary problems to be a loss of faith, we're adhering to the wrong politics. I see the chief cause of most of our current cultural problems to reside chiefly, in a sense, in having lost our minds, not our faith. In a moral refusal to admit, we understand that our minds can know the natures of things so that we might continue falsely to believe this refusal is a sign of some kind of higher Gnostic truth or belief system by which we are elevated to a kind of enlightened understanding that transcends the rules with whom we often have to associate on a daily basis. Because in a sense we have lost our minds, not our faith, I maintain that we can only culturally renew the West by reuniting philosophy and science and science and common sense. And we can only reunite philosophy and science and science and common sense by reunite, reuni reuniting human reason with sense reality. As Gilson tells us, since our chief problem is that we have lost reason, to recover the health of our minds, we must turn our minds again to the world, to have them measured by the being of things, not by our unbridled and un unmoored poetic imaginations. To Gilson, this means that we must attempt once again to inhabit the universe of St. Thomas, in which the service of God and reason are compatible and produces in us order, beauty, and joy, not nausea. Because in this world, unlike the contemporary world, the necessary condition for the one does not entail the necessary destruction of the other. For sharing the same cause is part of the same creation or organization. The order of our freedom, thoughts, and reality are complementary parts, contraries of the same organizational whole, not contradictory opposites whose coexistence is impossible because the existence of one being destroys the existence of the other. In this return to common sense realism, a main thrust of my argument in this paper today is that when most people use the term, the phrase common sense, we tend to use the term somewhat ambiguously, in somewhat the same, somewhat different senses, and that in its chief sense, 
we tend to recognize that the chief principle of common sense is not a common experience in the Aristotelian sense of doing something repeatedly and memorizing, but practical knowledge, as many people often appear to think. Instead, it's an evident conviction that precedes common experience and practical knowledge comprised of essentially four unshakable convictions. The evident existence of one substantial whole composed of essentially relatable organizational parts. An organizational unity within a thing that constitutes the truth of things. In other words, organizations exist, as we say in my neighborhood in Baltimore, which would be evident. If the fact that I am in the neighborhood, you wouldn't survive too long. Reliable human knowing faculties of sense and intellect that can adequately apprehend the truth of things. The, the analogous unity of truth existing among things and the human knowing faculties. And for the way things act reflect are signs of a relationship of organizational wholeness existing upon the parts of the multitude which possess this wholeness through one equal relation to each other, through one equal relation to a, a leading part through which a common organizational aim is chiefly communicated through all the parts. As Anna Keeney observed decades ago, the chief cause of our cultural disorders today arise from common sense defects of our intellectual leaders, teachers, and settlements. The disorder of modern culture, I would told us, is a disorder of their minds, a disorder which manifests itself in the, unity, in the universities they have built, in the educational system they have devised, in the teaching they do, and which through that teaching perpetuates itself and spreads out in ever widening circles from generation to generation. I maintain that this defect is chiefly due to a denial on their part of one or more of the above common sense principles I've just identified, which are the remote first principles of all other common sense principles. So those that happen to talk about is common experience, including those involved in sense wonder, upon which sound, any sound philosophy, science essentially depends. Such being the case, if we want to stop the decline of Western culture and global civilization, we need to do a Hail Mary pass over the skeptical, sophistic, and essentially anarchic mindset that tends to dominate in West, modern Western political and educational institutions so that we can learn again, once again, how to communicate with each other in properly scientific, philosophical, and religious ways. This is something that I think Gilson was concluding just after World War II as he was musing about how some Westerners tend to be slow learners. I've needed some time to grasp the full implications of a late modern project. At the close of World War II, Gilson claimed we in the West had made our most astounding, involuntary discovery. Late modern science had become essentially Nietzsche. The great secret that science has just wrested from matter, Gilson observed, is the secret of its destruction. To know today is synonymous with to destroy. Joseph considered Nietzsche's declaration of God's death to be the capital discovery of modern times, bigger than the explosion at Hiroshima. While his friend and fellow Frenchman Jacques Maritain was musing about how to use recognition of natural law to form common practical agreements among the world's people to generate future world peace, Joseph thought that Nietzsche's declaration of God's death signaled from a metaphysical revolution of the highest, widest, and deepest order in the West. Nietzsche is metaphysical dynamite. He knew it readily admitted. As he said in a prophetic 1948 article entitled The Terrors of the Year 2000, which Richard E. Guardian first called my attention to decades ago, Joseph considered Nietzsche's declaration the capital discovery of modern time. Compared to Nietzsche's discovery, Joseph maintained that no matter how far back we trace human history, we will find no one people to compare with this in the extent or depth of its cause. Joseph thought that Nietzsche's declaration of God's death signaled a metaphysical revolution of the highest, widest, and deepest order. Nietzsche is metaphysical dynamite. He knew, knew it. He readily admitted it. This is not just our imagination, Joseph stated. All we have to do is read Nietzsche's Ecce Homo to find proof that what Joseph said is true. As Nietzsche said, I know my fate, they will come when the remembrance of a fearful event will be fixed to my name, the remembrance of a unique crisis in the history of the earth, of the most profound clash of consciousness of a decree enacted against all that had been believed 
enacted and sanctified right down to our day. I am not a man, I am dynamite. Clearly to Jilson, the chief terrors of the contemporary age are a new cause metaphysical. The chief class of cultures and civilizations we face today is not between the politics of West and East, between traditional political liberals and conservatives or the West and other political orders. It's a metaphysical clash between the ancient and modern West. Gilson maintained that from time immemorial, we in the West have based our cultural first principles, our cultural Western creed and scientific inspiration upon the conviction that gods or a god existed. All of our Western intellectual and cultural institutions have presupposed the existence of God or gods. No longer, all of a sudden, God no longer exists. Worse, he never existed. The implication is clear. We shall have to change completely our every thought, word, and deed. The entire human order totters on its face. If our entire cultural history depended upon the unswerving conviction that God exists, the totality of the future must needs depend on the contrary certainty that God does not exist. The metaphysical terror now becomes evident in its depths. Nietzsche's message is a metaphysical bomb more powerful than the atomic weapon dropped on Hiroshima. Everything that was true from the beginning of the human race will suddenly become false. Moreover, mankind alone must create for itself a new self-definition, which will become human destiny, the human project. What is that destiny project? To destroy, Gilson said. Nietzsche knows that as long as we believe that what is dead is alive, we can never use our creative liberty. Nietzsche knows and readily admits his mission is to destroy. Hence he says, when truth opens war on the age-old falsehood, we shall witness upheavals unheard of in the history of the world. Earthquakes will twist the earth, the mountains and the valleys will be displaced, and everything hitherto imaginable will be surpassed. Politics will then be completely absorbed by the war of ideas and all the combinations of powers and world society will be shattered since they are all built on falsehood. There will be wars such as the earth have, will never have seen before. It's only with me that great politics begin on the globe. I know the intoxicating pleasure of destroying to a degree proportionate to my power of destruction. If Nietzsche was speaking the truth about his project, as uh, Gilson thought he was, Gilson maintained that he was announcing the dawn of a new age in which the aim of contemporary culture its metaphysical project was to make war upon, to overthrow traditional truths and values. To build our brave new world order, we have to overthrow the metaphysical foundations of Western culture. Before st state, stating what will be true, we have we will have to say that everything by which man has thus far lived, everything by which he still lives, is deception and trickery. As Nietzsche says, he who would become a creator, both the good and evil, must first of all know how to destroy and wreck values. In fact, Gilson maintained our traditional Western values are being wrecked all around us every day, everywhere under our feet. He said he had stopped counting the unheard of theories thrown at us under the names of various, as various as their methods of thought. Each the harbinger of a new truth which promises to create shortly, joyously, busy preparing the brave new world of tomorrow by first of all annihilating the world of today. What then are we who should oppose Nietzsche's project to do in the face of such a cataclysm? Nietzsche's plan, his mission is to destroy today and to create tomorrow. Gilson considered forgivable that we should not have anticipated Nietzsche's advent, but that we should not understand what he's doing while he's doing it right under our eyes, just as we were told he would do it, that, that bears witness to a stranger blindness. Can it really be that the herd of human being that is led to the slaughter has eyes and that does not see? Gilson's explanation for such a depth of blindness was that the announcement of a catastrophe of such an order usually leaves us but a single escape. To disbelieve it, and in order not to believe, to refuse to understand. Those who reject the escape of sticking our heads in the sand, while we are sheepishly led to the slaughterhouse, have another more common sense choice. To recognize the reality of the enemy we face and the nature of his project and reasonably to oppose it. Contemporary man tends to be essentially Nietzschean, and his mad ambition is impossible to achieve. We choose the way we can, not the way we wish. We might wish to become absolutely free creators, creators ex nihilo, 
but at best our wish is an impossible dream. True creation, Jilson recognized, is not fashioning material like a demiurge. It's a totally self-authoring, gratuitous act, the only act which is truly creative because it alone is truly free. As much as we might wish to become free, in this strict sense, our essay, act of existence, is always co-essay, co-existence, not essay subsistence, subsistent existence. The nature of the material world confronts us, limits us, and determines the extent to which we can fashion and remodel it. We shall have perhaps be great manufacturers, Jolson maintained, but creators never. To create is to turn ex nihilo. Man must, to create in his turn ex nihilo, man must first of all reestablish everywhere the void. This then has become contemporary man's project. Mad ambition everywhere to reestablish the void. On all sides, postmodern man, falsely so called, feels Nietzsche's intoxicating joy is mad delight in the power of destruction. When Gilson said Nietzsche is the Antichrist, he was speaking of Nietzsche metaphorically, like, much like Socrates says, the Adelphi Oracle singled him out as an example of wisdom in her cryptic message to his friend Chiron, that no one is wiser than Socrates. The Antichrist is postmodern man, falsely so-called drunk, with a supremely lucid madness, Gilson says, of a creature who would annihilate the obstacle which being places in the way of his created ambitions. Such is the profound sense of our solemn and tragic adventure. Antichrist is not among us, he is in us. It's man himself usurping unlimited creative power and proceeding to the certain annihilation of that which is in order to clear the way for the problem, problematic creation of all that will be. While Joseph did not say so specifically, the, the Antichrist that Joseph described him as embodied metaphorically, in Nietzsche is the secularized ghost of, of Renaissance humanism haunting the earth. The contemporary to the, is a, a attempt to supplant creation with metaphysical epic poetry effected through the unbridled free spirit of artistic destruction. No wonder then that Gilson would turn to a critic of Stefan Malamari's po poetic project to find just the right phraseology to describe a poetry which would have the value of preternatural creation and would be able to enter into rivalry, rivalry with the world of created beings to a point of supplanting it totally. Contemporary man's project is universal surrealism, total release of human reason, of created free spirit, from all metaphysical, moral, and aesthetic and common sense control. The poetic spirit, the spirit of the artist, got totally mad with the intoxicating sur surrealistic power of destruction. Once we destroy everything, nothing can stop us. Since the beginning of recorded time, God has gotten in the way of the artistic human spirit, has been the eternal obstructor to us being total self-creators. Now the tables are turned. With the advent of a new age announced by Nietzsche, we have entered the decisive moment of a cosmic drama. Protagoras and Musaias have become Dionysus. Everything is possible, Jim Silverton admonished us, provided only that this creative spark, which surrealism seeks to disclose, deep in our being, be preceded by a devastating flame. Since the massacre of values is necessary to create values that are totally new, Andre Breton's description of the most simple surrealist act becomes perfectly intelligible and throws dramatic light upon the increasingly cowardly destruction of innocent life we witness in our own day. The most simple surrealistic act consists in this, to go down into the streets, pistol in hand, and shoot at random for all your worth into the crowd. As he was writing in 1948, Gilson understood that many intellectuals in the early post-World War II era, era had not fully comprehended the metaphysical drama unfolding before them. As a result, while they had gotten out of the habit of talking about things like divine law, some like Maritain apparently still Hold on to a vestige in enlightened, uh, hold on to its vestige in enlightened, secularized appeals to the voice of conscience to solve the world's problems. Well, what will happen to us, Jason asked, when one of us start to realize that the modern voice of conscience, and presumably its principle, the modern understanding of natural law, is the reflection of nothing, a convenient illusion we have created to maintain the intoxicating joy of our own poetic and sophistic project. Gilson clearly appeared to be saying that if a natural law truly exists, 
looking today into international law for evidence of its existence of the notion of the dignity of the person that supports it historically in order to overcome contemporary intellectual incoherence cannot work. The chief reason that our falsely so-called postmodern world is essentially hostile to such notions is rooted in the late modern world's essential moral, metaphysical, and political rejection of the first extrinsic principle of natural law, the existence of a creator God. Instead of presuming a common agreement about the existence of a natural law upon which to build a common consensus about human nature, like his friend Jacques Maritain had done, Gilson appears to have been saying Maritain would have been better off facing the reality of the world around him in recognizing that the modern project is essentially rooted in a rejection of natures, of forms and things, and that it, the incoherence of the modern thought cannot be overcome unless and until, like an alcoholic, incapable of self-recovery, modernity first hits bottom and accepts a common sense understanding that forms exist in facultatively independent realities that today we commonly call organization. If modernism and false postmodernism are built upon a rejection of the existence of forms and things, on the existence of real organizations and of gods, or a created God, upon which the classical understanding of natural law depends, how can we make appeals to that law to give us a true postmodernism based upon the common understanding of the human person that will allow for communication between substances? To Gilson's ears, the explosion of Hiroshima resounded a solemn metaphysical assertion of post Nietzschean late modern man's statement that while we no longer want to be God's image, we can still be God's caricature. While we cannot create anything, we now possess the intoxicating power to destroy it. As a result, feeling totally empty and alone, late modern man offers to anyone willing to take it. The feudal freedom he does not know how to use. He is, he's ready for all the dictators, Joseph says, leaders of these human herds who follow them as guides and are all finally conducted by them to the same place, the abattoir, the slaughterhouse. Having freed ourselves from divine rule, the necessary political consequence for postmodern man, also so called, is political enslavement to the totalitarian state. Having refused to serve God, we have no one left to judge the state, no arbiter between us and the state. As Gilson saw it just after World War II, appeals to conscience helped some of us in the West, <coughs> apparently Maritain included, to pretend not to understand the catastrophic consequences for the West and the world of the grandiose sophistry of the post nietzschean project. Our destiny has become an absurd and truly exhausting task of perpetual self-invention. Our destiny has become the absurd and truly exhausting task of perpetual self-invention, without model, purpose, or rule, having turned ourselves into gods. Joseph maintained we do not know what to do with our divinity, finding ourselves totally free to engage in the perpetual Sisyphean task of endless self-creation. Joseph said we resemble a soldier on 24-hour leave with nothing to do, totally bored in the tragic loneliness of an idle freedom we cannot productively use. Clearly for Gilson, in this work, <coughs> the terrors of the late modern world are, in root cause, modern, as well as moral and metaphysical. But as I've said, for Gilson, the chief class of civilizations we face today is not between the politics of East and West, and the West and other political orders, between the Western tradition and other metaphysical and religious traditions. It's a metaphysical and moral class between the ancient and modern West. No wonder exists why this current metaphysical moral clash exists, exists. <clears throat> having essentially divorced itself from all moral and intellectual virtue, from wisdom and happiness and classical common sense realism, having reduced all these to its all-consuming method, like modern economics and politics, modern science has essentially divorced itself from all real human good, and the chief end of human life, the creator God. As a contrary of real science, modern science has embraced as its natural and real end. Science is opposite, natural and moral and intellectual vice, including foolishness and the chief natural end of foolishness, human misery. Since the time of Descartes, science forces so called 
has divorced itself from any essential connection to wisdom, virtue, and human habits. The human soul, human habits, and a creator God from all human, from all human good and, the cl and classical common sense. In place of these, it has gradually identified itself with an intellectually blind urge, this name will, the power, to torture the physical universe to reveal its secrets. Such being the case, having embraced the kind of intellectual Machiavellianism as its nature, why should anyone be surprised to discover such a blind urge eventually to reveal itself as the neo-sophistic inclination to dominate, naked violence, universal despotism, no knowledge that knowingly separates itself from wisdom and happiness can legitimately claim to be science. It's foolishness. It is now famous to start 12 September 9th, uh, 2006 address at the University of Regensburg entitled Faith, Reason, and the University of Memories and, and Reflections. But better than the 16th offered to the world community a positive critique to help modernity expand its intellectual horizon to avoid real dangers that arise from the incoherence of modern thought that Benedict called a self-imposed limitation of reason to the empirically falsified. The void of such a broad name, the notion of reason, Benedict maintained that the Western world is incapable of entering into general, the genuine dialogue of cultures and religions so urgently needed today. He claimed that while the West widely holds the positivist, that positivistic reason and the forms of philosophy based on it are universally valid. It largely cannot recognize the universal validity of forms of religious reason. This puts the West in diametric opposition to the world's profoundly religious cultures, who see the exclusion of the divine from the universality of reason as an attack on their most profound convictions. He said, a reason which is deaf to the divine and which relegates religion into the realm of subcultures is incapable of entering into the dialogue of cultures. Put slightly differently, the Pope was saying that people cannot enter into genuine dialogue with other people, cannot genuinely communicate between substances unless we enter into rational dialogue with them. Such dialogue must have at least two characteristics. One, it must be in touch with reality, and two, it must assume the rationality of the interlocutors. Unhappily, the modern Western notion of reason arbitrarily tends to limit rational discussion, communication between substances, to talk about mathematical being and sense experimentation. It tends to view all of the talk as essentially non-rational. Hence, strictly speaking, people who hold this narrow fundamentalistic notion of reason cannot enter into rational debate with other people about moral and religious issues because their narrow understanding of reason cuts them off from such debate about these issues. More or less, the Pope was saying that in relation to religious and moral issues, the modern West's narrow understanding of Cartesian and Enlightenment human reason places it in the same situation as many Muslim fundamentalist extremists. Modern Western reason tends to be arbitrarily narrow because it tends to be essentially fundamentalistic in a secular way. It cannot rationally dialogue with people about moral and religious issues because it has rele relegated religious and moral being and talk to the sphere of the essentially non-rational, capricious, and arbitrary. The Pope Emeritus rec well recognized and recognizes that this places the West in an extremely precarious position relative to religious cultures, especially to extremist elements of Islamic culture. How are enlightened Western intellectuals supposed to dialogue with Muslims who think that God is an arbitrary will, not subject to behaving according to mind independent standards of rationality, like non contradiction when the Western intellectuals have a view of moral, political, and religious reason as essentially irrational, but at the secular extreme as their extremist Muslim counterparts? The West view of moral, political, and religious reason tends to be a secularized reformulation of a popular Reformation notion of the essential depravity of reason, religious reason in the contemporary West sense. Case. Just as narrowly fundamentalistic as that of Muslim extremists. Hence, strictly speaking, modern Western intellectuals cannot enter the debate because by their own admission, because of their ignorance and unjustified presumption of their rational superiority, they are totally incapable of conducting rational dialogue in the, in the areas of religion, politics, and morality. 
Clearly, if such dialects to take place, it will have to occur between individuals in the West and East who do not share such a hubristic and narrow understandings of rationality. Well, modern scientific reason has to accept and base its methodology on matter's rational structure and the correspondence between our spirit and the prevailing rational structures of nature as given. Benedict claimed the, the question remains why it has to be so. Moreover, he asserted that the natural sciences have to demand this question to philosophy and theology to answer, because the natural sciences are incapable of addressing the question. Benedict maintained that philosophy and theology are sources of knowledge derived from human experience, much of which in the West comes from religious traditions and Christian faith. He made special reference to Socrates' observation in Phaedo that extended philosophical argumentation involving talk about being might incline a person to mock all such talk, and in so doing, be deprived of the truth of existence and suffer a great loss. In a similar fashion, Benedict claimed that the West has been, has long been endangered by the subversion to the questions which underlie its rationality and can only suffer harm to them thereby. He argued that to deny, to ignore theological and philosophical sources of knowledge is an unacceptable restriction on our listening and responding to reason, and is something we do at our peril. Hence, he concluded by asserting that a theology grounded in biblical faith enters into the debates of our time with a program that involves the courage to embrace the whole breadth of reason, not to deny its greatness. It is to this logos, to this breadth of reason, he said, that we invite our partners in the dialogue of cultures to rediscover it constantly is the, the great task of the university. During the 20th century, Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI's predecessor, St. John Paul II, was able to help colleagues introduce this logos to the philosophy department at the Catholic University of Louisville, and now the Pope John Paul II Catholic University of Louisville. As a result, with the help of Vyacheslav Albert Krumpiets and other members of this philosophy department at Kuhl, the Pope was able to cause the personalist metaphysical principles of the Lublin School of Thomism to radiate from his department throughout Eastern Europe and severely weaken the disordered notion of science that held these people for decades under the yoke of the babelism of scientific socialism. No reason exists why a similar revival of Christian metaphysics throughout the West cannot be the same for the entire West in our day. It is to the same logos that this conference is dedicated uh, is dedicated. In his Regensburg Address, His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI attributed the attenuation of modern reason largely to a concerted effort that started in the West several centuries ago to remove the influence of classical reason, especially Greek philosophical reason, from the modern notion of science and higher education. Devoid of proper understanding, we in the West cannot enter into rational dialogue with other cultures. If we do not know who we are, how we came to be the way we are and think the way we do, if we do not precisely grasp our situation and its history, we cannot possibly expect rationally to listen to and understand other cultures. More than anything else today, we in the West need a renaissance of philosophical and scientific reason. A recovery of the understanding of the reason that is out of touch with reality, which refuses to have its judgment measured by mind-independent reality, has lost its common sense and is no reason at all much less a scientific or philosophical reason. If the chief cause of our contemporary attenuated notion of reason is the loss of classical reason, it's philosophical realism and common sense, and the essential connection of science and virtue to wisdom and human happiness, then nothing short of a new renaissance of common sense, philosophical, and the theological reason. What my friend Bill McVeigh has done, born again Thomas, can restore Logos to its proper place within the contemporary world cultures. It is to this great logos, to this breadth of reason, that in the spirit of Emeritus Pope Benedict, are dedicated this conference, the new head of the Aquinas Institute, Holy Apostles College and Seminar, Seminary Graduate from Mystic Studies Concentration in Christian Wisdom, to begin in the fall of 2014, a recently established Aquinas School of Leadership, and the formation of an Aquinas Leadership Circle. All these are dedicated. I welcome those listening to this inaugural conference lecture to join us in promoting these efforts, and I thank you for staying awake through this lecture.
questions that every, every